good morning. It's so good to see everyone here. If you will, stand with us as we begin our time of worship and sing Open Up the Heaven. sing the praises to our God and our Savior this morning. Excuse me. And we know that um, when we come into this place, we can lay everything down and trust Jesus, and um, we can come back to the heart of worship. Y'all sing this with us. Deeper within, through the way things appear. 
with me in prayer. What a sacred moment, O oh God, as we gather with people of faith here in the sanctuary and those downstairs to seek your face and to sense your touch of love for all of us. And so this morning, though your Holy Spirit lives within each of us, we pray now, O oh Holy Spirit, that you will touch the service we will bring honor to Jesus. And as we see him high and lifted this morning, each of us will bring a new and fresh surrender of our lives to him. In his holy name we pray. Amen. What a wonderful sight this morning in the 830 service to have so many gathered here for worship and have folks downstairs. And then in this service, again, this beautiful, beautiful choir behind me. And you're going to be blessed with their music this morning. It's such a beautiful job they've done as Lynn leads them. And to see you here this morning in this service, thank you so much for your commitment. It's always an honor to have guests with us, and we have guests in every service. So thank you for being a part of this time of worship and fellowship uh, as we continue our time with the Lord. Also, let me thank you for your commitment to Sunday School. This morning we had 248 in Sunday School, which is very encouraging. So thank you for reaching out to folks. And as I mentioned in the early service, remember there are so many people in your fall who do not have a church home. There are literally thousands, thousands right now who are not in Sunday school or worship anywhere in follow. And so you and I have the opportunity as we go about our lives each week to meet people and to invite them to come and to be a part of the fellowship of God's people here. So let me encourage you to make inviting folks a natural part of your life each day. We also, I'd like to remind our men that we have a men's prayer breakfast on Thursday mornings at 6.30 in the room directly across from the library. We'd love to have you come and join us for that time. Also this summer in the month of July, we have a vacation Bible school planned and you'll be hearing much more about that as time goes on. So be in prayer for these key events in the life of our church. Again, thank you for coming. And I hope this service will be a time of the touch, the touch of God upon your life as he draws you closer to him.
occasion Jesus said his house will be called the house of prayer for all the nations. So this morning across the years people of faith have gathered in this room to pray and to seek the face of God. So you bow with me as we pray. Lord, it's so important as we meet in this room and as many are meeting downstairs that we sense the touch of your Spirit upon us. For through your Holy Spirit, we're drawn closer to the cross. And as we're drawn closer to the cross, we'll sense more of your divine love and grace for us. Often it's very difficult for us to grasp how you love each of us so much sinners that we are. We want so much to be true and faithful to you. But the truth is, so quickly and easily we, we err and we stumble. We fall flat of our faces. It's unbelievable, really, that you're so patient with us. You don't give up on us. Sometimes we tend to give up on ourselves but you don't. And so, Lord, this morning as we bow in your presence to sense your touch, we just want to say thank you for never giving up on any of us, but always reaching down and picking us up when we fall. Every person in this room today has experienced some serious challenges this week. The truth is, so many people face challenges that are just overwhelming, bigger than they. But the one truth that shines out through all the years of challenge is that your grace is always enough. Often we wonder, how should we deal with the next crisis? But if we wait upon you, there will never be a moment that your grace doesn't sustain us. So Lord, for those this morning who are hurting so badly in this room and downstairs, will you touch each with your touch of, your touch of grace so that each person here this morning would understand the depth of your love and the care you promised to provide. Father, there are so many people in our community who don't know Jesus. So many folks all around us who have no church home. Holy Spirit, please grant to each of us a sensitivity that will make us aware of folks we can invite just through a simple invitation to invite them to come to be a part of the people of God meeting in this place. And now as we wait before you, speak to our hearts that personal word that each of us needs to hear from you. A word of encouragement. A word of hope. That you really do have us in the hollow of your hands. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you. 
redeem from the hands of the enemy if you really know that he's washed you white as snow if you know what it's really like to have a song in the darkest night then lift your voice in one accord let the praise ring unto the Lord let the redeemed of the Lord say so Miss Lynn gave us a really good workout on that one there. <laughs> Isn't it great to know that God's, all of God's promises are true? So let's stand and sing about those promises. Standing on the promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout
then you may be seated.
Sir Catherine, thank you so much. Beautifully done again. Thank you. Please turn with me now in your Bible to John's Gospel, chapter 6. John, chapter 6. And hear the Word of God as it begins in verse 66. John 6, verses 66 following. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He met Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. Wherever Jesus went, immediately swarms of people gathered around him. There was something so refreshing about Jesus that wherever he went, people gathered to be with him. They wanted to hear him. They wanted to be in his presence. But because Jesus was who he was, he never, ever misled anyone. He wanted to make sure that anyone who followed him understood exactly what that meant in everyday life. Jesus said in verse 56, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. This statement simply meant that when somebody took Jesus into life, Jesus would literally take over that person's life. And when those who were following Jesus heard him say that, it was a shocking thing for them. And so many of them chose not to follow him anymore because they said, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? After he said that, and the people responded, John wrote, Many of those who have been following him left with no intention of coming back. This is a powerful passage. May the Holy Spirit help us to hear and understand Jesus' words. What does it mean to forsake Jesus? Many who heard Jesus talk about to follow him meant he would take over life were simply not willing to do what Jesus demanded. Jesus demanded unconditional allegiance. He demanded absolute loyalty. Many of those who were following him, when they heard what he said, indicated that was too difficult. They had no intention of doing that. They did not understand that to follow Jesus meant the giving of their lives to Him. They didn't understand that. Because so many of them simply could not grasp what Jesus said, could not accept it. John says, many of them walked away and they never had any intention of coming back. Now surely if Jesus had said, it's okay for you to follow me sometimes, it's okay for you to be a moral person. It's okay for you to be respectable. It's okay for you to give loyalty to me once in a while. Then most likely many of them would, continue to, would have continued following him. But that's not what he said. He said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, I will be in them and they in me. That statement was too hard. These folks who were following Jesus as his disciples... They enjoyed being around him. They enjoyed looking at him. But when they understood what he said, it meant to follow him, they said, that's too much. We have too many other interests. We're just not willing to sell out like that to Jesus. And so John says, they walked away. Isn't it strange how we have missed what Jesus had to say? Somehow in the midst of our following, we have not listened to what Jesus had to say. In our culture today, respectability, 
morality, Christian, are all synonymous. Nothing could be farther from the truth according to Scripture. Jesus said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood allows me to enter their lives and live there, they will be my disciples. Somehow we have missed that. So that in our culture today, we're accustomed to cultural values. We're accustomed to doing as we please. Make no demands on us. Expect no discipline from us. We will do as we jolly well please, when we please. And if it's convenient, then we'll be disciples. We live in a culture that's misled us. We live in a day that's deceived us. We have forgotten what Jesus had to say. So forsaking Jesus simply means... We become so casual about it that it's really no big deal. Oh, we're good people. We practice good morals. We're respectable. But we're not following Jesus. He did not mince words. And so this morning, each of us has to ask, has to ask ourselves the question, am I just simply being a convenient, casual disciple like, that many, like those many there or am I deadly serious about my faith in Jesus? We have become a content group. Life as it is, as we please, rather than what Jesus had to say. Ron Meredith described an interesting experience. One beautiful moonlight night, he suddenly was outside, he was outside and suddenly heard the honking. He saw this V-shaped bunch of geese up there. We've all seen those, these big Canada geese, as they fly in the sky and at night, the moon was full. Those geese were just, oh, they were magnificent. They were just beautiful. Ron said he went back in the house. And he wanted his people to come and see, his folks to come and see. They all stepped outside. It was just magnificent. But that would have been fine if that's all that happened. But suddenly it dawned on him. Right down in their pond, they had a bunch of pet mallard ducks. With the honking of those geese, he could see the feathers just moving a little bit on those mallard ducks. Because they were designed to fly like that too. But you see, the problem was they had become real interested in all the corn that was on the ground in the barnyard. Those mallards enjoyed all that corn. They were perfectly content just to enjoy that corn. They never intended to do as God created them to do. And so this morning, how serious it is for us to look at ourselves and say, have we become content so that in a casual thing, we're simply forsaking Jesus too, just as these folks do. What does it mean then to follow Jesus? Here's what Jesus had to say. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. May the Holy Spirit help us to hear this. That means, folks, that as food and water are within us to nourish us and to strengthen us. So when Jesus is within us, He's identical in the same way that food and water are to us in His spiritual presence within us. As He is within us, we become His servants as He's the Lord of life. It's kind of like Drawing a line in the sand. We make a decision to move from here to here across that line and, and we say, today I give my heart and life to Jesus. I give Him the absolute loyalty of my life. Unreserved commitment to Him. You remember the beautiful story on Mount Carmel when Elijah the prophet with all the prophets of Baal, were gathered there. God's people had come. Elijah said with a booming voice of a prophet to the people of God, listen, why do you still waver between two opinions? Elijah said to the people of God, if God is God, then follow Him. If Baal is God, then follow Him. Or Jesus said on another occasion in Luke's Gospel, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, which means death to self, and follow me. And then he said again in Luke 9, he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for service in the kingdom. 
Somehow we've missed what Jesus had to say. We've listened to the culture we live in. We've listened to all kinds of voices. But the one voice that matters we've not paid attention to. Our Lord said clearly in His Word, whoever would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. That is, surrender everything that you are to Him. That means every day. More and more of our lives are transformed into the image of Christ. That means every day that we live, our lives are changing every day because of the power of Christ. When Jesus lives within us as food and water are within us, things happen in a positive way. And so this morning, may each of us hear the words of the Lord. We are to grow and change daily as we give more and more of ourselves to the Lordship of Christ. That's serious stuff. Somehow or another, in our culture, we have equated respectability with being a Christian. The two are opposite in every way. And so this morning, may we ask ourselves the question, how much of my life does Jesus occupy as Lord? It reminds me of a, a story I read about a wealthy young man who had this beautiful, elaborate house with all kinds of rooms in his house. One day, he invited Jesus to come and live in a beautiful room in his house. It was upstairs on the far end of the hall, a magnificent room. He took Jesus there and said, Jesus, this is your room. You stay in this room, it's yours. That night, when the young man had gone to sleep, he heard on the door. So he got out of bed, walked down, opened the door, and there were three demons that come to attack him. He did battle with them. And as he was doing battle with those demons, he wondered, now, Jesus is in the house. Why are these demons here? Why doesn't Jesus come and help me? He finally won the battle with him. Went back to sleep. Next day, next night, same thing happened again. He'd gone to sleep. And after he was sound asleep, he knocked on the door. He walked out of the door and opened it, and there were dozens of demons. For three hours, he battled with those demons. And he wondered, why doesn't Jesus come out of that room and help me? Why are these demons here? Jesus needs to help me. He finally won the battle after three hours. So he decided the next day I'm going to ask Jesus, why didn't you help me? So he met Jesus the next day and said, I don't understand. Why didn't you help me? I thought you loved me. Jesus looked at him and said, young man, I do love you. But you put me in the room at the end of the hall and you told me to stay there. That was my room. I've protected my room. I protected where you told me to go. And then the young man said, Oh Lord, I am so sorry. Forgive me. I want you to have all of my house. So the next night, the young man wondered what would happen. And surely enough, around midnight, he slipped out of bed only to see Jesus go into the front door. Jesus opened the door. There stood Satan. Satan wanted entrance. Jesus said, Satan, what are you after? And then Satan realized it was Jesus. He said, oh, I'm so sorry. I have the wrong address. He and his demons left because now Jesus occupied all of the rooms. So I ask you in conclusion a simple question. Does Jesus occupy all the rooms of your house? Will you pray with me? Lord, when we read closely what you had to say, what a powerful, powerful word. It's sad to realize how often we have simply not paid attention to what you had to say. We live in such a culture of convenience and ease and self-centeredness that we have the tendency if we follow you once in a while, that's enough. Or if we show up occasionally for whatever you've asked us to do, that's enough. And then we're just jolly well pleased doing what we want to do the rest of the time. Holy Spirit, please help each of us understand what Jesus had to say. Being respectable and being moral, those are not enough. They're important, but that's not what, what makes us a disciple of Jesus. Jesus has said very clearly, if you want to follow me, 
and you must eat my flesh and drink my blood so that I am within you and you're within me. And day by day, I control everything about you. That's what it means to be a disciple. So this morning, Lord, if there's anyone in this room or downstairs who has gradually eased away from the loyalty to you, I pray your spirit would touch that person. Help that individual to understand that forsaking you is a serious matter. And remind each of us that to follow you means we make an unqualified, unconditional commitment to you as the Lord of our lives, asking you to be the full authority over every aspect of the way we live. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Just as I am without one plea, is the only way any person can ever come to the Lord. If you're in this room this morning, what an honor it would be if you've never confessed your faith, for you to come and confess your faith this morning, or to come to be a part of our church fellowship, whatever the Lord's leading you to do. As you stand and sing, just as I am. Just as I am. Thank you so much for being here this morning. And for our guests, we're honored that you've chosen to worship with us. We'd be honored to have you anytime you can worship with us. And now as we leave, remember, someone's watching you this week to see what it really means to be a disciple of Jesus. Will you pray with me? For these holy moments, oh God, we give you thanks. How I do pray that each of us will listen to the words of Jesus. And we'll make sure that by his standards, we're his disciples. That is crucially important. In his holy name we pray. Amen. I'm so glad.